You're talking to Sid Vicious, three-time WCW World Champion, two-time WWF World Champion, and I am the master and the rule of the world, and watch Hannibal TV. We are back with uh, two-time WWE and two-time WCW World Champion Psycho Sid Vicious here. And this is a part two interview. If you want to watch our part one, it's up for free on uh, the Hannibal TV's YouTube channel, so you can check it out there. So with this interview, Sid, I'm not going to go in chronological order. I'm going to ask you questions from all over the place. Sure. Actually, it's um, three-time world champion in WCW. A lot of people forget about one. And it was my most uh, remember, more than I remember the most. The one I had the most fun is where I was world champion for like 30 seconds. Uh, do you remember that? If you refresh my memory, okay, I was, I was in Halloween Havoc. I was working with Sting. Oh yes. Okay. What happened um, on that Devin back in those? And at that time of the business, it was only four pay per views a year. So you know, they come to me. Oli was booking the time. Says, "Hey, said you know, from every interview here on out, you say that you're going to be the next world champion." And so I was doing that. You know, and people like Ric Flair would come to me and say, hey, "You know, you're not you're not supposed to say you're going to be world champion because if you're not world champion as a heel." That's really bad for you. So that's why well, I'm, I'm I'm only doing what they're telling me to say, you know. So uh, they have the match. Long story short, um, he says, "Okay, get your heat on Sting, stop him doing his comeback, take him U I U I C P U U I C Pavilion Center in Chicago, and that was a University or something." Uh, he says, "It's like the old uh, sportatorium had a door that you, everybody came in and out." Says, "Take him through the door." He'll come back through the door, come into the ring after you get back. He'll be like favoring his head, and you act like, you know, don't worry about it. You just roll him up penny one, two, three, you're the champ. Well, all that took place, and, you know, that's again only four pay per views a year. But Barry Whittem to take a little time off during that time. He lost a little weight. Comes in, I see him as Barry, and I go, Barry? He goes, Yeah, just roll me up, don't worry about it. So I roll him up. I rolled him up and I'm thinking to myself, because no one even told me that, uh, you know, not you know, earlier that night or nothing. So I figured they'll say that Sid cheated or something happened. Well, uh, I had the belt and I, you know, had the belt raising it, probably looking at the fans and there another referee came in and was grabbing the belt from me and I heard the fans go crazy. I looked at Sting's in the ring, he goes, take the Stinger Splash, one, two, three. So they took the belt from me and I took the Stinger Splash. And, you know, and that never was explained to me. Mm -hmm. I never didn't ask any questions. So, so I don't know why that happened now. I think some people have said that, you know, one, Ole was pretty much on his way out and it looked like he was trying to damage everything for the next booker. It would be hard to put the pieces together. And uh, I don't know if that was part of that or what happened, but I was actually three times. How did you like Barry Windham? We actually interviewed him in January and he's gained a lot of weight in uh, recent years, I guess. You know, Barry was okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, we were all f part of the Four Horsemen there for a little short time together. Um, hard to describe Barry when he was it's sort of like always missing a lot, you know, but all of a sudden you wouldn't know where he was if somebody had some weird story that he met some woman and, you know, she was a, something and he moved off and all of a sudden he showed back up to work and like no, you know, work like he, you know, had never been missing. You know, but he'd just be missing from work for a you know large amount of time to show back up. Um, I think he was a pretty good worker, you know, um, but uh, just pretty quiet. You know, nothing you know special. Andre the Giant was still uh, around WWE a little bit here and there in the early '90s. Did you ever meet him? I did. Um, it was sort of a scary deal, you know. Um, I guess he saw me one night nip up, you know, I was able to nip up, you know, from the, from the ground. And he saw me do that one night and he came to me and he was, you know, in the back, like always drinking wine and playing cards. He comes to me, he says, uh, I want you tonight, tonight, go to the ring. No, I, this is when I was also jumping from the floor to the apron. He says, jump from the floor to the apron, grab the ropes and then just flip over into the ring. And I was thinking. <laughs> I said, hold on, man, this is live TV. You, you know, you're told not to take any chances, and I didn't think I could flip if I wanted to. So I didn't do it. And he was like the first person to meet me on the way back in. He goes, I thought I told you to do that. And I was like, well, sir, I didn't know how to do it, you know, but that was really my only experience with Andre. So you know, he uh, was nice to you from that yeah, conversation? Yeah, really nice guy. 
Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a video that someone's posted on the internet of Bam Bam Bigelow before he died. He said that he had his first match with you and he kicked you and you shit yourself. And that doesn't seem like something that would have happened. So I'm just wondering what your response would be to that video. No, I, that, that never happened. You know, I don't, honestly. He said he had his first match with me. No, he said you had your very first match with him and it stuck out to him because he claimed that that occurred. Now, this is what's weird. I've heard that uh, The Undertaker said that, that I had shit my pants in a match with him. The thing yeah. is, I've, this is, we'll make this clear, I've never shit my pants with anyone. Yeah. Um, no, I don't remember ever working with Bam Bam. I, I mean, I worked with him quite you know, a few times in the WWF, but you know, as far as like when we first started, you know, I was uh, doing that Lord Humongous character down in Memphis, and he was Bam Bam Bigelow, but we never even worked in the same... Yeah, he said some, said some other things in shoot interviews that weren't true, that I know for a fact aren't true, so I figured that was some jealousy, perhaps. You know, no, I wouldn't think it's jealousy. I'll tell you the thing about Bam Bam, and I've always said this about Bam Bam, and I'll still say it today, uh, I think he was one of the smarter, you know, had, as far as psychology in the ring, he was one of the best there was, as far as like being in a different town, know, know how to react or get the people to react. Um, a funny story about Bam Bam, you know, when I was on the whipping post in the WWF at one time, you know, it was like, you know, I, you know you're getting beaten. This is when I was having to work with, you know, uh, you know, people I didn't think I should be putting over. But again, I had left Vince. I'd gotten to the deal with Arn. Really didn't have a place to go. Uh, so I had to sort of put up with some things. And that sort of, they put this uh, stigma, on me, stigma on me that I couldn't take a turnbuckle. And this goes uh, to Carl Ouellette, uh Pierre. Um, we were in England. And it, it said that I couldn't take a turnbuckle. So, and the thing was, truly, I wasn't taking great turnbuckles anymore because I wasn't a type of person who took turnbuckles. And from that spent stint where I was Lord Humongous up to that point, I just really, well, nobody was sending me in taking great turnbuckles. So Carl went over with me at the Royal Albert Hall there in England, showed me how to take one correctly. And it was just coincidentally, it was in a match against Bigelow. So we did, a, I'll never forget the spot. It was a, I took the turnbuckle came out of it and then he gave me a, a clothesline over the floor and then we had that two or the best matches on the on the uh, card every night and that stigma was lifted and taken off of me because of that right there you know um and that's how we hear about how things like that can get, uh, get put on a person and uh, like the softball thing was on me but no not anything like that with big uh scotty um we always had good matches together he, he always uh, worked real hard with me we worked again i like working with him um uh, him people like vader they were just workhorses and when you got an opportunity to work with the workhorse it was made it fun and speaking of softball i've heard that you were actually discovered by jerry lawler at a softball game yeah but it was you know, we known each other uh you know playing softball together and i think what had happened i'm not 100 percent sure um somebody i think that was going to come in for like a two three week run as a you know special uh, attraction in the Memphis territory. I heard it was Terry Funk, but for some reason they didn't show up. He saw me at a softball game, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a little wrestling. He's the one who gave me the Lord Humongous costume at the time. I had made one later on myself, self one that was a little better looking, but he's the one who put that on me. And I got, I think I worked like three weeks in the territory where I worked Memphis, the Louisville Evansville thing a couple of times. And I guess when the deal was over, who that was intended for, you no, know, I got, you know, got, didn't get released, but you know, you know, didn't do any more shots for him. And then I got picked up subsequently, uh, luckily for me, for by Continental with the same character, Lord Humongous. That's why I made my own costume, and that's how I started the Lord Humongous character. How did you get along with Lawler over the years? I get along with him great, man. He was always really nice to me, um, very professional. You know, I treated me as well as anyone ever treated me in the business. You know, um, you know things you'd, you you'd want to happen for you. You know, he, he kept me really strong in my character, um, always gave me great advice, um, you know, always helped me, never did anything to try to set me back. What are your thoughts on his son, Brian Christopher, recently passing away? 
I think that's one of the, uh, it still bothers me today. You know, um, you know, thinking about it uh, after it's happened, you know, I sit back and think of a lot of things about Brian. One, we forget, you know, Brian was a really hard worker. He worked really hard uh, to do well in his matches at night. And when we were working the Memphis territory, I was working the Memphis territory because I was, again, on the whipping post for Vince, and it was after the deal with Arn. So I worked the Memphis territory for about a year until I got asked back to the WWF. Um, but I remember this what it was, you know, we still work in the kayfabe deals, but you know, we'd be, I'd have people in my vehicle, he'd have people in his vehicle, and we were racing to get to an exit to get uh, uh, what we thought we were doing something cool. We were getting chocolate milk uh, with donuts, and it said, you know, fat free, all it was, it was skim milk in your chocolate donuts. But that's what we were actually, that's what I remember. We were, there were no drugs involved. There was nothing but Brian trying to sell his eight by tens, his t-shirts, and, uh, and then again, I'd smoke a joint. Uh, Brian had no and uh, p part of it, and we, we're just running to get our donuts and chocolate milk. So then, when you hear something like this happening, it just um, it still it really bothers me at this moment. Even thinking about it. And Brian, I think Brian is a, uh, almost like a little brother figure. You know, he was always never gave me any crap ever. You know, um, uh, just again. I can only, I, when, I, I, every time I think about it, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm still in shock over the whole thing because he's, um, he was a really a lot of fun to be around and, and um, I didn't see the bad things everybody else saw. And speaking of uh, the weed, have you heard that later this month uh, it's going to be legal in Canada? It's actually going to be fully legal. No, I didn't hear that. Yeah, they're, cool. they're changing the laws. Could you talk about your broken leg incident in WCW and why you went off the rope that night when it wasn't a common thing for you to do? Well, um, what it was is, you know, um, really what the deal was I had, had shoulder surgery and I didn't want it, really people to know that I still really was having a hard time like just putting my belt on um, and um, things like that and then it was really affecting me in my workouts and I was having a hard time coming getting back to work from it and I've, I've not been really totally mis if I totally accurate about this but I don't even think I was really medically cleared at that point to even come back they said hey we need you we need somebody on the show this night and so I just came back to do what I could you know like we all do um, and when Johnny asked me to go up on the rope to do that you know at first it said hey I'm out. I don't do that you know stuff off the rope and trying not to tell the truth that hey my shoulder's still hurting and finally I just said hey man I'm not comfortable with it and he said um well hey we've already got it written in and the truck meaning the camera people know that that's the spot for the mystery partner to come out and the mystery partner of course it was his brother and uh, of course he never really showed up because it broke my leg before he got there but it was uh, something I would I did want to do something I wasn't comfortable doing and I probably would have been comfortable doing it if I had four good arms I'm not somebody flying off the top rope, you know, and then um, uh, and then Scott Steiner always, I think in my opinion, took one of the best boots out of the corner that anybody ever took. He didn't need to jump off the rope. Jo Scott did a tremendous job of making that look good, and I think it was just a, him, someone trying hard to impress the company. How did you like working with the Steiners when you were teaming with Danny Spivey? It was just, you know, that was a, it was, those days for me were, again, I was, you know, like a baby, a kid. It was just having fun. It was, um, um, and back though, back in those days too, you got to remember you had the Steiners, you had me, you had Vader, Stan Hansen, Dr. Death. Uh, it just goes on and on. So it, everything was real physical. Uh, so, you know, it, it wasn't like it was any more physical or less physical, but it was just good physical, a lot of fun. I was in the learning deal I was put with Danny uh, it was pretty much said we're gonna put you with Danny till you learn to be a, a singles because that's what my you know future was going to be now he later played the role of Waylon Mercy in WWE why do you think after that huge build-up it was pretty short-lived for him yeah well uh, you know Waylon Mercy gimmick of course we all know that's a gimmick Vince had been trying to get over for a long time and then the latest version 
Danny Spivey. No, the latest version was uh, I haven't. I uh, haven't watched Wade, Ray, uh, Bray, Ray Bryant. Oh yeah, Bray Wyatt. Yeah. Bray Wyatt. That is the version. That's the I guess. That's the version Vince was looking for. And I tell you, I, what was happening there is this. You know, we've, I've said this a million times. This is when people weren't getting paid, um, and then of course they were. And, and Danny was. I think having a tougher time at that point physically, and, and, and he was the type of guy he wasn't going to put up with any shit from no one. And uh, we were in Winnipeg, if I'm, I think I'm 100 percent sure on that. And we were having breakfast, and he said, "Sid, won't you give me a ride to the airport?" I said, "Why?" He said, "I'm going home." And uh, I did. I gave him a ride to the airport, and uh, he went home. Now you were part of the Four Horsemen for a while. What did you think of being part of that group at the time? Well, you know when you you know. Um, you know, at that time, again, I was pretty new to the business. I thought that was a heck of a cool thing to be a part of that. You know, of all the people that had been a part of it before, it was something that was over. I was like automatically over because of that. Hey, you're one of the four horsemen. It was, um, you know, it was, it, to me, it was a lot of fun. And there was an uh, incident during that time where you had a little battle with RoboCop. Uh, that's now a popular video on the internet. What are your thoughts on, on the RoboCop uh, movie robot? Uh, I think it was a Capital Combat. Yeah, it was at, at, the, at the Cap Center, I think, or it was in Washington, D.C. I don't remember having a feud with him. Oh. No, I don't mean a feud, but like you had like... You had to act like you were afraid of him. Yeah, right well, you know, I, what I really remember the most about it, my oldest son, Frank, who the one was on the show Big Brother, he was like four or five years old, and that was really the only wrestling event he went to because to, he wanted to see RoboCop. thing about it was is he was almost as tall as RoboCop because Robo, the guy RoboCop was pretty short. Okay. But I thought, honestly, again, I thought it was a really cool thing for a WCW to have something like that. And I think that's what the purpose was is for WCW to show that we're being like WWF, we're, we're bringing the show biz to, to, to wrestling. Now, Lex Luger, a lot of people have varying opinions on him. Uh, what have your thoughts been on him throughout the years? I think my thoughts on him has always been the same. You know, Lex, um, he was a hard worker as far as, you know, um, did a lot of things in and out of the ring to make him who he was. He worked hard in the gym, um, always you know, worked real professionally in the, at the rings and stuff. I just, my opinion, I think he was a little robotic you know, that kept him from, but he was as over, he was as good a spot as anybody ever been in the business. Um, he was real honest about, he didn't um, really care for the fans. He did, didn't really care for a lot of people, probably didn't care for me. Uh, he just really liked himself and and he was you know, upfront about that. So when someone's like that and upfront about it, you don't have a problem with it. It's, it'd be when they're saying, hey, I, I'm one of the boys and you're not one of the boys. And, and Lex, uh, like myself sometimes, rode by himself. Is that why you think the Lex Express uh, whole gimmick didn't really get as popular, popular as it could have because he didn't have that passion towards the fans and just... No, I don't think that would stop a gimmick from, I don't think that would stop, I don't think the fans could real, you know, say that Lex didn't like the fans. I just think that was a stupid <laughs> deal. No, and then too, it only, not only was it stupid, I think even Lex think it was stupid. And then I, I, I think all the boys had, hated wearing those Lex Express things on their wrists. But again too, uh, like we were talking earlier today at lunch, no, that's the beginning of the WBF, okay? And if you remember, if, I can't remember, maybe you can correct me. I think, talking to Lex, I think Lex really wanted to be more of the WBF. He wanted to be more a bodybuilder than he did the wrestling at that time. Yeah, I think he was initially signed to the WBF because he had the no-compete clause with WCW, so he couldn't even wrestle for a year, but then he had that accident. So, oh yeah, the accident too. Yeah. But um, so but, that like derailed the WBF, and I think it was already out of business by the time he was. Yeah, <laughs> and then too um, that whole thing. I just think again, it was bad timing. He really came in when the you know the business was really on a downhill skid, and then Vince had taken those other business adventures, and and um, everybody it was just everybody was playing so hard trying to get play catch up, and then I just and I just think that was a horrible gimmick. And you were friends with uh, Eddie Gilbert. Can you just give us your thoughts on him? You know, Eddie was one of the greatest guys 
um, a real innovator in the business. You know, really love the business passionately. I'll tell you one thing about it. He's one of uh, maybe underrated um, or didn't, people didn't talk about his wrestling ability enough. And I, I've told this story a bunch of times. Uh, Jerry Stubbs, who is to me a nice enough guy, his wrestling character was Mr. Olympia, wore the mask, which we know is a horrible, hard, hard gimmick to work, uh, especially as a baby face. But I saw Eddie Gilbert take him in, and, and I'll never forget the town, Meridian, Mississippi, which was a tough town and it was like a 45 minute match and within that 40 minute mark man those people were you thought Jerry Mr. Olympia was Hulk Hogan that's how great Eddie was and then on top of that too what I thought liked about Eddie I thought he was smarter than a lot of other bookers where um, he might you know, he had a lot of reason probably to dislike a lot of people that was in WCW when he was booking. I'm sure a lot of people were saying things about him buying his back or stuff, but that never stopped him from using people. You know, if he even if he didn't like, if he thought you had something to offer the business, which you don't see that very much in the business, uh, people would let their egos take it control and and don't make the right decisions. And he was just um, again, he was a. Uh, really instrumental in my career you know he came into continental when i was lord humongous just starting really gave me some really great ideas of then and then uh after i lost my job um um actually i was in japan and was working the memphis territory and eddie had come through memphis and wcw and was telling a guy named ken wayne he was looking for me to give me a, a trial well the memphis wrestling heard about that and they cut my money knowing that i was going to quit so i was without a job for a couple of weeks and the japan office was really upset with me because they didn't have a place to come take pictures and all of a sudden i got a phone call i didn't have a phone uh it came through my father-in-law's uh, business at his car lot and it was Eddie. I remember getting the phone and says, "Man, kid, how about a tryout?" I said, "Shoot, yeah." And then the rest is history. So, uh, Eddie was is as probably responsible for my career as anybody was. A lot of people wanted me to ask you. We went into whole, the whole details of the Iron Anderson incident. We won't get into that again. But a lot of people wanted me to ask you how it's been with him since. Do you guys just act cordial? Yeah, you know, after the deal, the, when I got brought back to WCW, you know, um, you know. I was in a room, they brought him in and said, okay, Iron, you know, Sid's back. And we he said, if you guys have, I think, said anything to say, I just said, like I said a thousand times, you know, I said, Arn, I'm sorry that it happened, especially with you, because, you know, Arn had always stuck his hand out to help me, uh, help me with my interviews when uh, it's a tough thing doing interviews when you don't know how to do them. He, he showed me how to start off and got me rolling on it. and. Um, I just again, I, I hated it. it had been armed that that happened with. And the, your feud with El Gigante and uh, WCW, how did you like those matches? You know, honestly, that was those matches were me to get out of there to go to WWF. Okay. And I was told to do, Vince says, do whatever they ask you just to get out of your contract and come here. And actually, those matches were to put me over. I was going to have him, they were going to stretch him out. Uh, but when I had decided to leave, they. You no know, change their mind. How were your dealings with the Undertaker overall throughout the years? They were always easy, good. Um, Mark was always very business, and we were good friends. To you know, rode together quite a bit. From knew each other in Memphis a little bit, and then um, in WCW hung out a little bit because he actually took my place as a skyscraper when I had my lung surgery. And then when I came back, Danny sort of wasn't around anymore and me and Mark sort of rode together you know a little bit and hung out together and knew each other f from then to now and just always really good guy and you know, I couldn't say anything bad about him. Now I recently Matt watched your WCW match with Vader um, which was who has the best power bomb that's was that was how it was built and you won that match with a choke slam so I was, I was wondering why there was no actual power bomb in that match was that an office decision or? Yeah, I mean, if office decision whatever I couldn't probably power bomb Vader if he helped me you know it was weird you know um, I was when I went to WWF for the first time 
uh, was Jock Rougeau, they were having me like just come to TVs and just announce that like have someone like say Jock go out to the ring go, I'm the baddest dude or whatever. Anybody back there want me come and get me? They'd have me come down powerbomb guy. Well, then after a couple of nights of that, Jock said, hey, can you do something that says powerbomb? I said, that's my finish, man. He just didn't want to do it. So I don't know if he went to someone else, but then Pat and them come to me and go, well, tonight we want you to um, powerbomb earthquake and typhoon. I said, I can't get my arms around those guys. Same thing with Vader. I, I couldn't have powerbombed him. And what are your thoughts on his uh, passing? Man, I hated it. Uh, again, you know, Leon, we we all know he was a little bit of a spot picker, but he was a harmless spot picker. He never hurt anybody. Um, you know, he, again, just a super nice guy. One of the guys I enjoyed working with as much as anyone, him like B Bigelow, uh, workhorses, uh, just gave everything they had every night. Um, Reminded you that also Vader would remind you how good he was too. But uh, again, just a really great guy. Enjoyed being with him, laughing with him. And it, when I think about it, it really saddens me that he's not here. Now, I'm not asking this because I have anything against Vader. I know you like him. But I was, we interviewed him and he also did a great interview with us. But I watched an interview of him saying, that you were originally one of the people considered for the Vader gimmick in Japan, and he didn't think that gimmick would have worked with you because he doesn't think you could have worked with the smaller guys as well as him. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. The uh, thing is, I, I wouldn't, now, of course, you and I talked about this earlier today at lunch. I was actually brought to Japan to take Bruiser Brody's place, uh, and that's somebody I would have, that had been easier. We're sort of the same height, sort of somewhat, I worked myself in sort of sort of some of the same style that he had. But uh, I never was told that I was ever uh, and, uh, even thought about doing the Vader gimmick. But um, I don't think I couldn't have done it as good as Leon. And I, and that just, um, gimmicks are hard. And I, at that point, getting out of Lord Humongous, I don't know if I'd want to have gotten another gimmick. And that was even hard for him. That thing didn't work when it was supposed to. Uh, the cool stuff, the smoke and fire. So again, um, I'm glad I didn't get a chance to do that. And Psycho Sid is probably more your real personality. Yeah, well, of course, we know the reason they call me Psycho Sid is because of the stabbing with Arn. Yeah, because that's a play on the Psycho. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I, I don't know if I told you this before, but uh, I didn't know that was my name that night. Uh, you know, Vince says, you know, actually, I was working for the Minnesota Territory and, you know, tried to make a big secret out of it. He flew me in. We were up and doing a show in Evansville every Wednesday like we do from Louisville to Evansville from Tuesday to Wednesday. And during that day, I flew into the office and we sit there and talked about coming in and doing some stuff. And then um, um, back out that night. What was you asking me there again? The, uh, <laughs> no, I even forget, but yeah. something about the Psycho Sid name. Oh, yeah. So they brought me back and asked me to do it. And I said, yeah, I'd like to come back. And so uh, I think it's Macon, George is our first TV. And I actually walked to the ring and um, I, I don't even remember said what they called me. Uh, and I don't remember the music and the, and the lighting, if, from my understanding, was like the water in the shower from the girl yeah. getting stabbed. I didn't even know that. So when I come back to the dressing room, I'm the last one. And I usually am the last one to know that I'm getting ribbed. And some of the guys, who it was this. They go, you know what just happened? I went, no. They said, you just did the shower scene of the Psycho movie. I went, oh, shit. So it was sort of, I, I didn't pick up on it myself. Yeah, I didn't even realize the connection until you explained that. I'm sure a lot of fans would be the same. What did you think of the Sid Justice name when they gave you Sid Justice? You know, I actually told Vince, because you know, I considered myself a little bit like John Wayne. That's why I wore all black, uh, uh, Johnny Cash and, and John Wayne. But... Um, uh, I just, I, I didn't like it. I, you know, there's a word for it, I can't remember. But, you know, there's times in the business when they'll people will come up with things and, and not really have anything in store for after, you know, like a like when they, let's use a, uh, when I get heard about when they did Kevin Nash with Oz, you know, Dusty's idea was to do the deal with Oz because Turner owned the, the, the movie Wizard of Oz, but he had nothing to do, any ideas to go after that. It's sort of the same thing with Sid Justice. You know, they had the wearing like a pink cape and a pink tights or beige or something like that color. Baby, 
I think it was baby blue. Well, right? baby blue too. But at first, they were actually, the, and I never wore it. <laughs> okay. It was it was a pink because uh, I didn't, I wouldn't wear it. I said Vince, is, I said Johnny Cash is rolling over in his. You know, it was actually, John Wayne was dead. I said John Wayne's rolling in his grave right now. I don't think he know what I was talking about. I said I'm not wearing pink. It's just a, I think the coincidence I was wearing a really nice dress shirt a couple of weeks prior to that when the seamstress person looked at me and I guess with a good tan it looked good but um, and and really the color tights were if you go back to that was Dusty Rhodes idea um, he wanted to see me in color tights not just black and I was wearing that singlet thing to, because of the scar on my side and he wanted me also to get rid of that and go back just to the regular tights okay so that was sort of Dusty's idea and you had, it looked like you were going to have a few with Big Bully Busick, who recently died. Uh, what? At one, oh yeah, he, he's dead. You didn't know he's died? No, I did. Yeah, he, he's dead. But uh, if you go online, you can see there was some angles at various events, but nothing really. What happened, out. this is, was just a totally the opposite, uh, Devin. I was bringing him in, um, like we all do, stupid things. Um, when I made the decision to go from WCW to WWF, I sort of lied. Uh, Dusty did promise me that I could bring Bruno into the WCW, but he wouldn't be with me. But we'd just give him a job doing something. I always promised Bruno if I got a chance, I'd give him a job. So I sort of That's did Harvey Whippleman. Harvey, yeah, yeah, Harvey Whippleman. So I, I used that with Vince, but of course I was a baby face first. And so I said, now I knew Nick from the gym. Nick was a really world class uh, power lifter. He held totals all across the United States. I seen him, I seen him bench press 700 pounds, so I knew he was really strong. Um, and I didn't know he was a drinker and that was his uh, demise. But I got him a job with Bruno. And so what was happening was like, they actually came to me and said, okay, Nick's not getting over and he had missed a flight from drinking too much, I think with Jim Neidhart one night. But um, uh, it was a deal where he had to go down and work with Virgil and they actually had Bobby Heenan's little girl in the audience with a balloon. And all he had to do was take the cigar and pop it and he forgot to do all that and he didn't get over and stuff like that. So the very next TV tapings they had me working with him, I beat him and I think he was gone after that. Yeah, because they gave him a big build up too. So it's good that I finally know the answer to that one. Well, just cause he just didn't, he, did, he just didn't know how to get over. <laughs> And you were paired with Harley Race for a while in WCW. How did you like uh, having him as a manager? I liked it. I really don't remember a lot about that. I do remember being with him a little bit. He was also with Vader. And I think when we were, me and Vader were sort of doing our rubs together there, that's when Harley was. Yeah. Now, you gotta realize Harley, to me, was like my hero growing up. You know, to me, I still think Harley still is one of the better workers it ever was. Um, a lot smoother than Ric Flair, you know, and things like that. So it was, uh, that was, man, that was awesome for me. And you might be interested to know a lot of people commented on our last interview that they think as you're getting older, you actually look a little bit like Harley Race. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. That was, uh, a lot of people wrote that surprisingly. Maybe it was the hair that you had that day. Well, we both have curly hair. Yeah. Now, uh, did you ever work with Ted DiBiase? Yeah, I did. Um, one time. Of course, he was my manager yeah, for a little bit. Dollar yeah, and what that whole thing there, Devin, was is he was put on the road with me to see that I didn't get in any trouble. Right. Uh, and the deal was, it really, the, the real deal was I wasn't the one, you know, I got into that one incident with Arn, and that was the only time never I drank I, again. Never, <laughs> never drank, got in trouble. But really, you can ask Bob Holly this and Carl Willette. We did more babysitting on uh, for um, Ted, you know, because he was uh, under the microscope for having an affairs, you know, and he was using that church deal, which I, I despise him doing that. He was charging churches to go meet with him, but it, I he, believe he still does that. Yeah, he still him a fee Yeah, I can't, I can't do that. But he, we were actually stopping him trying to keep him from drinking and getting with women that he was constantly, I'll never forget one night, this is after he'd already gotten in trouble. Yeah, we were in the bathroom at some club and I heard a, um, uh, I couldn't, he, he didn't know I was in, he goes, man, he goes, I sure do thought Ted DiBiase could get better looking women than that. <laughs> he was some <laughs> ugly girl, you know, but he, he did that even after he got caught. 
<laughs> you know, so he was still trying to get ugly women. It was a promoter ahead of one of those, remember, build your shops up in Buffalo, and I think he screwed everybody over just about. Um, but he, you know, he, that's when I first heard it. He goes, yeah, you know, Ted DeVos, he tells me to get him hooked up with all these churches, and I, so I do, and he goes, I get him here, he goes, well, how much I'm getting paid? Now, and that's something I could never do. I could never, ever charge a church for something. I mean, I'm giving my money to the churches. I'm not taking money from them. Oh, um, uh, what was his name? Buddy Landell did that for a while. Too. But it's funny how all these guys get into religion when they, I don't know, at the end of the careers. It's just, um, it'd be great if one of them seemed sincere. But again, you know, we were saying, again, I just, I can't, I can't imagine asking money for church. You know, they need money. They're trying to do good things, you know. Now, you were in ECW for a time, and I guess you were hanging out with Rob Van Dam there. He's on, there's some clips on the internet of him talking positively about that. Uh, what are your memories of working for ECW? You know, it was a lot of fun. You know, um, that I think really what they did with me there, they, I don't know, I, I think ECW in, in, in general didn't want the guys to get over as much as they wanted the, the territory itself, the name ECW to get over, so they didn't really let me do interviews and stuff, but <clears throat> I just came down and squashed people and stuff like that. Um, I do believe Paul was advertised me in shows knowing that I wasn't going to be there purposely to try to make money. And matter of fact, when he had wrote us, me and Tommy Rogers, a hot check, I was doing an independent show up there in New York for, I think, in that area for Michael Bryan. We went to where their shows was. We walked in when the show was going on. Paul was really shocked that I showed up. And he was trying to keep me from the public seeing me because he didn't want me to, I think he actually, you know, had doing that before booked me on towns that he didn't ask me to do. He was embarrassed about that. So we went there to get our money, you know, make him write us new checks. Now for uh, Austin, you were with him a bit in WCW. I don't think you worked with him, but you would have known him. And then backstage again in WWF. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? I think he's a you know another you know typical um, person in the business that worked real hard. You know, worked himself in the bottom wherever he was and worked himself to a good spot and did really well for himself. And you've told us before there was a bit of jealousy with Hogan. Uh, during your first WWE run, but later in WCW, you teamed with him a few times. Was uh, that, that same jealousy there then, or was it all cool by the time WCW happened? You know, I think it was all cool. You know, I think Hogan had a really cool, uh, or uh, not cool, but had a way of, uh, um, you know, being nice to you when you were there. And I, again, he never said anything negative to me. I never heard anybody say that he said anything negative about me, you know, but, um, uh, you know, I don't know. When I was in WWF and pretty much was it was understood I was taking this spot or there to, you know, take over. Um, I think Vince did him purposely in some bad ways uh, to make him maybe, I don't know, maybe he had done some things before I got there that deserved to be done the way he did. You know, like that, I think I, excuse me, I told you about that night work in Albany you know, there was nobody. We were preconditioning the people for me to be the heel, not him. And they booed him during that um, Survivor Series, whatever. And, and I, I didn't see anywhere how Vince could have planned that to happen. That was just a spot where he tipped me over and the people booed him. Well, he came back and that's when I actually, I, that's the night I, I gave my notice to Vince. I said, you know, uh, he came in the hallway screaming, Vince, you playing that, da, da, da. I went, hey man, I went right to the restroom, I said, Vince, and I, at that time, there were a lot of other reasons I wanted to leave, everything, nothing went the way it was supposed to go. I said, Vince, man, I appreciate everything, but I said, I, I just can't work in a place where a grown man cries, you know, screams about stuff like that, you know, um, so that's really where I gave my notice. And you also worked with Randy Savage and WCW as a team a few times. Uh, any thoughts on working with him? It was always fun with Randy. Uh, you know, Randy and I, I guess a little bit f from the same, came from the same pattern. You know, I remember, um, and then, you know, and Devin, you know this in the business, and I tell people this, you have to be an opportunist. I mean, sometimes you have to do things that maybe the other person doesn't like and you got to figure out a way to get them to do it like i ain't saying this but you know what i know 
I like sometimes slapping people in the face. So to do that, I just ask them if they say, yeah, I did it, you know? Yeah. And so one night we were working, me and him were working with uh, Dean Malenko and maybe it was uh, um, Chris Benoit, but one of that group of there. And um, this is when I was getting the count number up to go against um, um, Goldberg. Goldberg. So he says to me, he goes, Sid, do you mind taking a drop toe hold? I, I take a really good, I do a really good drop toe hold. I said, no, Dean, what we'll do is this. You'll come in the ring, I'll power bomb you, I'll get a victory. I'll have the ref give another sign. Then I'll power bomb you again and we'll get another victory. And when we walked away from that, Savage said, man, that's, I love that, man. You know, because you, sometimes you have to put people like that into place. And overall, I know the smart marks really like him, but he was one of the most boring wrestlers to watch. Oh my play. God, he was horrible. No personality in yeah. his matches. Well, what, what do you, I don't even think he had a match in WWF. Yeah, they, they, they made him an agent pretty fast. Said so he was too short. <laughs> well, now he'd probably be one of the taller ones. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you worked with uh, the Iron Sheik and Sergeant Slaughter just a tiny bit in WWE. Uh, any memories of that? Just that one night, what that whole thing was, what that was for was, um, you know, when I first went to the WWF, you know, I was only to do TVs and pay-per-views for one year and after WrestleMania go into my first house show. Well, um, it just seemed like my whole career was taking the warrior spot. But um, that night was, they had me as the referee knowing right after the match that um, that's where they were going to change things, you know, pretty much start fading Hogan out, put me in and get rid of Warrior because they fired Warrior as soon as he walked through the curtains. You know, because I guess he was trying to hold him up for more money or something. And you told me that story earlier about Terry Taylor taking down the Iron Sheik. Why do you think he was so hated and how was your relationship with him? Is it just because he was in positions of power sometimes? No, you know, he really never was in a position of power. Agent, I guess. Yeah, you know, an agent is um, not really power. It can be a, probably a boring job sometimes too. But, he, you know, he, he would take the agent job and make it... Uh, like he did have power, he would create power if that's if that's the right way to put it. Terry was just I don't know. He just had a always a weird way how rubbing people the wrong way. And I could give you a million things with me, but I'll give you one where you know we're always trying to help friends get a job or something. Well, I was trying to help my best friend get in the company, and Kevin Sullivan had given me the office to get him a job. And all Terry had to do is just go to and see him you know, lock up and see you know, how to put his boots on and he was going to have, have a job. So we get out there and so Terry says, show me your base. And even I didn't know what he was talking about. Everybody around was, what he was talking about? Was lock up. Okay, because I would say a base would be an amateur wrestling yeah, position. Exactly. Well, we always yeah. wondered what he was talking about. And so that made, so what it did, it took my buddy from being able to start, okay, well, let's take you to the power plant. You know, but, but Terry just had a way of just, I don't know, just rubbing everyone the wrong way. Now, back to WCW for a minute. He wrestled Van Hammer, and he had a job for a long time, and I've seen a lot of his matches, and... I've seen some of the worst fashions of my life are with him, and I'm just wondering how you thought of working with him. Was he better by that time? You know, this what you know with him. Uh, there was a funny deal. That was my first match back at WCW coming from Vince from WWF, and what we did there was I had Robert Fuller come in and portray you know the old Colonel Parker character that I'm bringing in the Elvis in the bit to to wrestling, and we were using him just for that. And once I got after that night, he was to go on with who he did manage with Harlem Heat uh, because I didn't want a manager and didn't need a manager. But I just wanted sort of be compared to Elvis. And then it, it would be a good comparison for him to go on to manage other people too that he actually managed me for a minute. So the first match was against uh, Van Hammer. And uh, Bill Dundee, who you're fixing to art, you know, interview him, you can ask him the story if he remembers. So we're sitting there and Van Hammer is telling me all about all the stuff he's going to do. And bing, 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 bing. I said, no, dude, this is what we're going to do. Where he, how he, you know, he did his intro. I said, once I come in, I'm going to do this deal to you, kick you to gut, power bombing, and that's it. And he, he looked around and Bill said, I guess that's what we're doing, mate. You know, <laughs> so, of course, you know, I had, uh, I had Bill Watts' ear. Bill Watts was, I think at this time, was already out and Oli's in and Bill's, 
Watts, I think, probably brought Bill Dundee in. They had a relationship together. And the, but uh, again, I think Bill Dundee respected that too. He could, knew Van Hammer, his potential weren't, wasn't great and you didn't give people like that a whole lot to go on. Now, I heard a story on a podcast, of, but you didn't go into detail about it. I guess Bret Hart drew a picture of uh, the Brooklyn Brawler getting nailed by Pat Patterson. I guess Brawler was really offended by it or something. Yeah, what it was, I don't know. It was, uh, I know it was, I didn't see the picture, but it was a picture of um, supposedly, you know, what they call the career carpet. I think it was a bear rug. It had Pat, Vince, Ultimate Warrior, and... Um, Stephen Barty and maybe someone else I can't remember but Hercules was it was me him and me Hercules and um um Paul Roma maybe may, maybe and then and, uh, not pro- probably was Bruno Harvey Wilhelm okay. and then um but I remember uh, you know Steve was like I'm gonna beat the shit out of Bret Hart and this and that and, and Hercules from my understanding him and Lombardi was somewhat like first or second cousins or something they were calling each other cousins and finally Hercules just said hey man shut up you ain't gonna do shit you know there ain't no reason to do shit unless there's a reason you know but yeah he got really mad about the, that photo and it is quite a coincidence that Lombardi, I think, he was only just released a couple of years ago. He had a job for... The- well, you know why he got released, too? No. Well, it was, uh, it, it was, he was, and I don't know how, because I don't know anything on the internet, but Steve was actually leaking, from my understanding, information during shows. Oh, okay. So, you know, that was, you know, that was, had to be pretty serious to let him go. What do you think about that rumor? Because Carl has given me his opinion on that. <laughs> On that old Steve. Oh yeah, on the Pat, the old Patterson. And I've we've heard it about Paul Roma and Steve Lombardi. <laughs> well, you know it's not Paul Roma. Sorry, Jim Powers, not Paul Roma. Well, you know it's funny when you bring those names up, they all have a sort of a tie into that weird story you're talking about. I remember when I first went to WWF. I, I swear, man, I was really, I was like, something shocked me every day. Um, I remember. Ultimate Warrior and Kerry Von Eric, and I, I'm pretty sure Kerry wasn't involved in any of that. But um, Paul Roma was screaming, I mean, really loud at the Ultimate Warrior, going, "Hey, whatever he was saying, you know, on that carpet with Vince and them, that's the only way." I mean, he was screaming stuff like that where everybody in the building could hear that. And uh, so, you know, I don't know. Um, you. You like to think that that's not true, but I, I'm not trying to look for excuses to me, a dumb old boy from Arkansas, but um, I don't know. I just, it, just so many things that it, it was strange about the whole thing. I heard you say, like, and of course you never, like, were, had to be worried because you're huge and you had many options of places to work, but you said in another interview you felt uncomfortable around Pat Patterson a couple of times. Well, one was this, and it was just, again, you know, you don't, and, and, and the boys rib a lot and you don't know what's, who's joking, joking or not joking, uh, and then you heard these stories, I had heard the stories where, you know, supposedly Pat would call Sean's room all night long or knock on his door trying to get him to concede or whatever. Um, so my very first trip in the WWF was I was brought to the building by myself. I was dropped off there and all I was there was just to watch, understand, to see how they did TVs and how the WWF did their operation. Well, I ended up riding with, uh, back to the room that night with Pat, Vince, JJ, and, and uh, Howard Finkel. and worked out with Vince that day. He had me picked up in a limo with him. We went to the gym, worked out, went back to his room, took a shower, and went to the building. Well, you know, we're all now having dinner and, you know, Vince goes to the bathroom and I think Vince is sitting across from me and Pat's sitting over and Pat leans over me and says, what an ass on that guy. I was thinking, oh God, you know, and then he goes, heard y'all had a really good workout today. He said, I said, yeah, Pat, it was just a workout, you know. So that was a little awkward there. So we get to the hotel. This is Canada when the lightning is going on. He says, hey, you want to come to our 
Val, can you watch lightning tonight? I went, no, I don't want to watch lightning tonight. So he grabs me at the counter and says, I got the big son of a bitch in the waist up. So I you know, <laughs> really went around. I was like a real shoot, you know, uh, and, I, and I don't know ch chained wrestling. I really don't, but I learned it real quick. So I put my arm in and got around him and said, no, you don't have me either. You know, I said, I'm going to my room. And I really was scared that night. And I don't think they were walking by my room, but I had convinced myself of that. Yeah. You know, but, you know, and again, Again, it could have been written. It could just have been real. It probably yeah. was. But again, it was like, no, I don't want to watch lightning with you tonight, you know. And how things have changed now. First of all, the Brett would have been fired for those blackboard drawings and yes, nothing like that. Would, I guess was that before all the the uh, molestation allegations came out. That was that all the same time. Okay. You know, the, the the drawings all related. But you, you're right uh, about that, man. If, if any of that crap. If, or the you know the, the that's one thing and that and that's probably it was just a rib you know they know I'm married and that wasn't yeah. going on but now the, the other things that were you know were prevalent you know were like the things that I witnessed you know were we were overseas one time and uh, there were a group of young little boys sitting out from the hotel and I asked somebody I think it was asked the warlord what are these kids doing here because uh, well um, the uh, black ring announcer. Um, what was his name? Mel Phillips. Mel Phillips says, was fired, it says, yeah. says uh, th these, Mel's getting these kids tickets tonight and, and for return, he takes them to the room and plays with their feet. And I go, what? You know, so it's like, and I can tell you a million stories like that, you know, that. And that lawsuit, they ended up getting settlements. Like it wasn't, it never went to court. It was settled, but it was, they were undisclosed settlements. But I believe that was in relation to Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin. I, and now, I, 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 you're saying this, but since you, I'm going to have to say this because I'm going to say this in my book. This was a weird deal with Terry Garvin one time. You know, I'd heard all these stories and, you know, and after seeing Paul Roma act out like he did, I started feeling like maybe some of this was true. Well, Lowell Mass was a town, you know, coming from Boston. If you didn't leave early, you'd probably be late because of the traffic. So me and Kerry Von Eric, who I was riding with at the time, and Paul Diamond, we got there early. I'd say about maybe an hour early. And um, I went into a little small locker room they had there, Lowell. And um, as I was coming in there, Terry Garvin and this little chubby guy, that enhancement guy we called Jog Guys, um, black hair, I can't remember his name, but his they, their car clothes were all ruffled up. And I, of course, I'm thinking the worst, but I'm not saying anything. So I, put my stuff down and I sit there and just I don't even look at the kid you know and then, so then the kid just starts spilling his guts to me he goes uh hey man I don't want to do this uh, I just want to be a wrestler you know uh, I, I just want to go home to my girlfriend uh, I don't have nothing to do with this you know and so I said dude I'm not trying to be a jerk to you I said but you're never going to be successful in this business you're not going to be me you're not going to be Terry, uh, Terry Vinary you're not going to be a big star so I said go home and don't fucking ever come back. And he did. And Pat Patterson had uh, resigned through all of that. And now he was Patterson wasn't connected to the boys. There was a there was an announcer that had made some allegations. It was Garvin and Phillips that had to do with the boys, and they were never brought back. Right. So working with uh, DDP and WCW, how did you like that Diamond Dallas Page, yeah. or maybe just being around him? Yeah. Now he's become such a huge uh, guru. Uh, with this yoga, yoga stuff, I you know I I, I like Dallas as I guess as much as you could like someone just passing the locker room. I think he's a little bit weird. Um, I remember a trip with him one time. He was telling me how he sent this video into the WWF to try to get brought in to where he was showing him in a in a Cadillac with a bunch of girls and it showed him busting through the screen himself, going, "Hey, I'm Dallas Page, and bring me to the WWF." And I thought to myself. Dude, they're never going to bring you in now. You know, I just started, I don't know, I just think his way of doing things weren't the way I would do things. And what was uh, Nash like to work with? You had uh, matches with him, I think, in both WWF and WCW. He was easy to work with. You know, um, just easy. He was really so laid back. You know, he didn't really care. Um, you weren't going to have your best match of, the, of your life with him. Um, but it was, he was easy to work with. And what about Scott Hall? Scott was, he was good. 
He was really good. Um, did everything, <clears throat> took all bumps real well, was real giving uh, to himself. He'd give you anything, you know, you wanted. He always came up with things that would make you look good too, you know, so he was a good guy to work with. And you worked with Dr. Def Steve Williams in the UWF once. How was that match? Really wasn't much of a match. Um, you know, Dr. Def too, I worked with him once there and once in WCW at a TV taping in, in New Orleans. It was just a, just a TV match. It wasn't really that long. Um, not, you know, not something, it wasn't a match you remember that stuck out and said that it was a great match or nothing like that. I do remember at the UWF thing, he did a power bomb off the top rope with me and we broke the ring. Yeah, I can believe that. I was actually went to him and said, I tried to get out of that. He goes, no, we'll be able to do it. And I went, oh, she, you know, we, I did it. And uh, you mentioned you were riding with Kerry Von Erich. Was that during a period of time where he had uh, gotten himself sober? I don't know. I know he was working on it. I actually asked him um, one morning. I said, Kerry, I said, not that I'm a lifesaver or anything. I said, man, would you like to go to Vince and talk to Vince and see if he might put you and I on the road together and I'll help you whatever I can do to help you, you know, get yourself straightened up a little bit. And, um, he, and this, of course, the night before he passes out on this food and, and then that morning he said, Sid, I, I've, I've, I've sobered up. So I said, okay, you know. Because he was apparently a really nice person. He was he one of the him. greatest human beings you ever met. Um, just a true gentleman, true gentleman. And you've had lots of contact with Jim Cornette throughout the years. Uh, what's your relationship like with him? I don't really have a relationship with him. For whatever reason, I hear that he doesn't like me. Uh, I think it stems back to the deal with Arn, from my understanding, but he didn't like me. I don't really like him. Um, I think he's overrated as a manager, um, but I have no, no relationship with him. What did you think about Vince Russo as a booker in WCW? You know, I, th I like Vince Russo. When we met in WC uh, WWF, um, did a few things together. He brought me, we did a little book article where we went to the original place where they had Cheers at. Um, I just didn't think he was uh, a great booker. And honestly, I, I told him, I told Bill Bush, I said, man, I said, I, this, is, this looks purposely like a sabotage, you know, um, to, and, but now, from my understanding, what the, him and Ed Farrar's idea were, if they could show where they could really be creative enough to, say, start their own cheers or their own Saturday Night Live, I think that's what their goal was. That's what I was being, that's what we were sort of being told. Uh, of course, you know, like Bill Bush would have taken over uh, at that time, uh, sort of took over Eric Bischoff's place and um, probably was sort of the new boss, but he came up to me and said, Sid, we know this is some of these things are going to be difficult, but you know, if you'll do them, maybe every, everyone else will do it too. So we're really depending on you to sort of do what they ask of you. Not that I wasn't, but you know, this was the beginning of it. And he, they all knew that it was going to be <clears throat> different from what we would normally see. And they said, man, it'd really be nice. And I did. Uh, even though I didn't understand some of it, you know, um, but it was it was difficult. But uh, I like this for show, and I like Ed for our. Uh, they're really nice to me, but I don't think they were very good at what they did. And I heard an interview where you said you wrote a lot of uh, Colonel Parker's interviews at one time, and you advised him on them. Is there any other wrestlers you did that with? I helped him. I helped um, helped the Harlem Heat out quite a bit in their interviews, stuff like that. And anyone else that needed help or ask for help, no. But mainly those guys, because you know, after coming out of WWF, I did learn some things, and I learned what we weren't doing right in WCW. And that was being, you know, prepared sometimes. So with Colonel Robert, he was, he was, uh, he was my, my idea. So I wanted him to look good. So I helped him with some of his ideas and some of his interviews and things like that because you know, I wanted to show that I could do that. And by doing that, I actually, 
uh, I could have had a lot larger part if I wanted, but I was in the office with Ole when he was in, and also Bill Watts. Unfortunately, Bill Watts got fired before I got back in full time. But uh, you know, Bill asked me to be a part of the booking committee. And oh then, wow! Yeah, so I was, you know, I was, I spent as much time as I could in the office, and would come up with ideas. Actually, uh, that's how I got Colonel Parker and. Uh, the Harlem Heat hired. I, I, I portrayed that, those characters in front of uh, Ole, Dusty, and Jim Barnett. And then uh, Jim Barnett and Dusty, and I think the, uh, Ole, their concerns were if, if, if Robert could do the character as well as I was doing it. No. Right, that was their original game. They were cool and something, and they came out in chains, right? And he was like the. It, well, I guess it was similar well, to a southern... Well, this is what the whole idea was. That Colonel Parker was supposed to be, um, you know, uh, this big flamboyant person. And, and, and how they, he got with the Harlem Heat was that, you know, at that particular time, the governor of Louisiana was a big-time gambler. This is a, real, a shoot. And he always owed a lot of money to, you know, a lot of different things. He lost a lot of money in horse racing and stuff like that. So we came up, well, I came up with a little story that, you know, during a... I bet that he lost a lot of money to Colonel Parker, and Colonel Parker, instead of wanting the money, says, you know, hey, I, I, I proved myself being the greatest manager in wrestling because I brought Sid Vicious in, but I want to prove it with two people that were nobodies. So I want two people off death row. And that's why we brought him in in like the jean shirts and the, the jean pants, and they had those numbers on like they were out of just coming out of prison. And, and the thing about Stevie, he actually, had some really bad scars on his back, on his shoulder. And I wanted to use that to our advantage and say that that's where, you know, during prison, that the man beat him, the man being the guy in charge. And that was the whole reason yeah, for the, uh, Booker was in prison for real, right, at one point. Was he? I, I believe. Uh, he could have been. I didn't know turned, that. He's turned his life around, and now he's a huge humanitarian. But yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. But the main thing was this, is that you know, Stevie then really looked at it. And this is the thing is, too, I had, was being taught this in the business. Of, you know, we didn't have a real, you know, they'd have a strap match usually to get out of a angle or something like that. So I said, hey, we'll just start the strap match from the beginning. And these two guys, you know, have been in jail for the last, you know, how many years being strapped by the man. Now they're going to get their revenge on the man. They're going to strap everybody they see. Meaning that what happened is that they were strapping other people and, you know, working the WCW at that particular time, you know, Steiner's being, you know, one of the top tag teams, you're going to work with them or the Road Warriors or somebody like that. So at least when you got to a point like that, you could have a real gimmick match because these guys had been strapping people for some time. But um, Dusty didn't like it because that wasn't his idea from my understanding. And the uh, candidate said it was too racial. Uh, now, to me, how can that be racial? These are two black guys strapping white people. You know, um, and so then... Uh, just a little bit not an argument just a battle of words between me and Dusty where he wanted to call him Chi-Town Heat or something like that and I said well they I wanted to call him The Posse but a movie had just came out called The Posse I didn't want to copy that in hindsight I wish I would have that would have been a better name for him yeah. and it's nothing wrong by copying people and I just didn't know that at the time. So I said, we'll call them the Harlem Hellraisers. They were building themselves already from Harlem. So uh, in, in bickering back and forth, I just I succumbed to Harlem Heat versus he was going to call them Chi Town. He pretty much that was the Road Warriors deal. You know, I said, this, that's the Road Warriors. You know, so this is calm. They, I said, they've been building themselves from Harlem. So this is calm, Harlem Heat. Now, you were in Ready to Rumble uh, with David Arquette. What, were you, what was your experience like in that movie, and what did you think about uh, him becoming champion at one point? You know, I had, uh, you know, we all wanted to do a movie in this business. I think it was, man, it was not what I thought it was doing movies. It was as much fun. I didn't see the problem with making, making David Arquette the champ that everybody else did. I really didn't. Um, I didn't. I didn't see the downside of it like everybody did. The territory was already on its ass. Uh, I didn't think that was going to make it any worse. But I didn't think it was that bad of a deal. Um, they'd already made a joke. You know, at that time, Ed Farrar and uh, Vince Russo had made a joke out of everyone. You know, so one more joke wasn't going to hurt. 
Well, yeah, I think Vince Russo won the title and Bischoff possibly could have been champion. Because I know he pinned Bischoff to become champion. I don't know if Bischoff was the champion by that point, but yeah. it was meaningless. It really was. Did you hear Arquette is back wrestling now? Have you heard that? No. With who? Independence. Apparently, he wants to make his name for himself on the, on the indies to try and get the uh, respect back. Well, that's good for him. If he watches this clip, if I post it as an individual clip, uh, would you ever be open to wrestling David Arquette in Great North Wrestling? Sure, I'd work with you anytime. What would you What would you tell David Arquette right now? I'd tell you what my finish is: Powerball. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he needed to know. But no, you know, meeting him there at the movie set, uh, he was a really nice guy. You know, but again, uh, shoot, if he's getting in the business, I, I have all the hope that he does well. Were you backstage that night when the Harrises or Ron Harris maybe attacked Shawn Michaels? No, what it was, it were, we, it was a, there was a tour in the States and there was a tour overseas and I was over the tours overseas. Actually, that was the tour that we were talking about that I worked with Bam, Bam my Bigelow that actually got me out of the, off the whipping post okay. where I took the, was able to take a turnbuckle enough to make the O-ring move. And we had such a match that no one could follow it and sort of took some of that heat off of me. Uh, but no, I wasn't there, but it was out, I won't swear to this, but I think it was at the Madison Square Garden. And it was what happened was, because Ron told me this word for word, um, and Don was there too, what it was is, this is again too, people don't realize it. This is no exaggeration. These guys, and, and including me, weren't getting paid uh, for weeks and weeks upon time. Now, uh, a lot of us, not everyone, but some of us had money saved up to where we could make it on the road. And we did get paid, it just took a while to get paid. So what guys would do is they'd take their draws go home put it to their check in their um debit or credit card account and that would help them pay bills and be able to get back on the road next time well um what happened was and they weren't the only ones that did it several people had to quit because they just couldn't afford to go on the road so sean who was like me was getting paid pretty well you know where those guys weren't call them like pussies or something said man you guys are quitters or said something to them and then uh uh ron uh choked him you know grabbed him by the throat and knocked him up against the wall or something like that i remember that happening you know because that really bothered kevin kevin was going to beat don up which that would have never happened don would have killed him. kevin was on the tour with you yeah um they were you know i think it was ron that did that not don yeah, yeah. ron harris they look the same, so it can be confusing. Like, they're from Nashville or something, aren't they? Right. From around here. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Paige as the GM of SmackDown after all the uh, the controversies she's had? I think that's the stupidest thing. Um, but again, um, it goes to Devin of how the business is, and when the business is down like it is, they'll 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 okay things like that for when you think this is the time you don't okay something like that you know and that usually says to me that they're having a hard time business wise is that you know um again after that i would not let her i wouldn't have her on my show or i would have fired her immediately um you know i don't know we we always hear things from a distance i don't talk to anybody in there other than harvey wilhelman once in a while bruno but we don't really talk wrestling that much but um you'll hear like through other people's that now the company's going in this direction we're trying to direct ourselves towards children and and that again you know and that's why we're going to have hills and baby faces again or then the next week they're not going to have hills and baby faces anymore but regardless what the deal is you you don't have something that gets that popular and then make them anything special on tv i just disagree with that i don't have nothing against her um, you know, I don't have anything against any man or woman that want to do things, uh, but don't do it public like that. And then, then again, the, how bad was it? Was, was she just at home? No, she was actually at a live event. The, the video I saw was uh, that. Yeah, the one I uh, saw was with her getting double teamed or something. Right. Well, one was. There was two. I know there was. There was three or four. There was one of her. Uh, her with that guy, the white guy. Uh, uh, filming one of the um, what was the black guy's names? 
Oh, uh, from uh, what's it? yeah, I know who you're talking about. Um, no, he's with Kofi Kingston's group. Yeah, that it's group. not Kofi Kingston though, but yeah, but Xavier that, Woods. Yeah, so it, that sh- it shows him actually having sex with her, with the other guy filming it. <clears throat> then the other clip I saw was. Um, her okay, one of the titles is in the uh, yeah. NXT title or something. Right, and then it shows her in a wrestling arena having sex with that, that guy that I think taking the picture of it. And the other clip was just her loosening herself up with a dildo in the anal saying, this is what I have to do to loosen myself. I think she even says that. This is how I loosen myself up before anal. And I'm thinking, and then you see her on, that, I saw her back on TV, yeah. and then I thought, okay, they're gonna get rid of her. And then they announced she's got a retirement, and I figured that was their way out of it. And then when you see her back on there like that, I mean, the first thing I, I'm gonna think is that uh, it's one of those situations, she's got something on someone, you know, if, you know, I, I see, you know, like PBS, if Charlie Rose gets fired for hanging around his underwear, I mean, we know things have been worse than that in, in the wrestling business. Well, allegedly it might have something to do with, I guess people are apparently hacking their, their phones. I don't know how it works, but because Charlotte Flair has naked pictures out there, uh, Gail Kim, somehow people are supposedly hacking the videos. I don't know. They're putting them out there. I don't know. Thing first of all, just don't take a picture like that. Yeah, well, I agree. You know, but again, for but again, if you get pictures like that, you do not make that person. Um, you better keep them secret. Keep it locked up yeah, somewhere. Let them, yeah, yeah. Let them just do dark matches, but don't make them the GM of your show. Because when you when you search her. All that stuff will pop that up. That pops up. <laughs> well, a guy said, you know, I don't know anything about technology, but a guy that I know that runs uh, Psycho City Promotions, and that guy named Eric sent that to my phone, and, you know, I don't have, you know, I couldn't even believe I saw that. And I said, this is crazy. Uh, I just cannot believe that's happening. What do you think of, like, the, I guess X Pac's done porn now, Sunny, China. Uh, what do you th- and Hogan's had a video out. I mean, that was also right. or hidden. Well, you know, time. once you whatever you do, once you get out of the business is is your business. Yeah. I don't think it matters anymore. Um, I think X Pac. Yeah, I do remember him saying he did one and Shawna did one and uh, Sonny did one, but. I mean, who cares? Sonny did one long past her prime. I haven't seen it. In yeah. <laughs> that would probably be torturous to watch. Well, yeah, pictures exactly. I've seen it for. I don't know if you've seen this. I know you don't follow uh, wrestling, but it's pretty disgusting. But this is actually popular now. Like, there's a practice of, like, I don't know if you've heard of this Joey Ryan guy, the dick grabbing stuff that's done on wrestling shows. Rest, wrestlers, male wrestlers, like grab each other's nuts, and it's part of it's it's accepted as normal, and some fans actually like it. Uh, now you know what's weird about that, uh, uh, Devin. That's what I you know my very first weeks in the business that happened to me where guys were grabbing my dick. You no, know, but it was I think this you know sort of it was old timers. You know, this that, is like. As a high spot where someone's holding oh, it, or it's oh, really bizarre stuff. No, I haven't heard of that. But I mean, you know, the old timers would scare like an old guy did it to me, Buddy Wayne. You know, I'd come to the dressing room and he'd always grab my penis and go, "Man, if I was a girl, you'd be in me." I'm thinking, "Oh God," you know. Of course, you know that goes back with hearing all the stories that you know that it wasn't just in the WWF; it was everywhere that were, you know. You, paid your dues one way or the other you know yeah it's pretty it's pretty disgusting stuff so now it's like a high spot i guess yeah but it's like it's to me it's like then what if you have to wrestle a guy that does that in in his high spot and you don't want your dick grabbed you know grab his dick does that become accepted practice like i hope not here's here's one that has over a hundred thousand views Now, who's selling the guy? It looks like the guy holding his... I guess he's supposed to have like a super sticker. Sticker, so, yeah. I don't, I don't know, but... That, just that, like, that, you know, you've seen the thing where the guys do this and everybody falls yeah. down. I'd rather see that than that. You know, yeah. I don't want to see that, you know. Because yeah. if I had a family and I brought my kids to a show with that, I wouldn't. I'd leave. I, exactly. So, yeah, I was just... I thought you might think that, but... 
it just worries me what the business is turning into because it's, to me that's softcore gay pornography. Yes, exactly. Like, it is. And that's disturbing. It is. Well, the business gets disturbing. And what are your thoughts on Sami Zayn? You've already told me off camera, but I thought it was so funny. I may as well ask you on camera. It's just you know he's the he's just got the weirdest personality. He's got the weirdest body language. He's like a slinky. You know, and then um, now I guess they've turned him heel a little bit. Actually, I, I, I prefer him in that role a little bit more than as a baby face. He just was just over the top stupid. And have your thoughts changed at all of the uh, the Asian guy now that I think he's been U.S. champion a few times? Last time uh, you talked to us. Nakamura? Yes. No, I, I haven't seen him actually since last time, maybe once. Again... Um, I think, you know, I'll go back, it's a, maybe a weird comparison with Phil LaFonce and Doug Furness, you know, when we were, before they came in as the Caribbean Express, you know, we would go to our cars at nighttime and we'd hear the Mars go, uh, you know, the Caribbean Express is coming in. I'm like, who are these guys? And it was like, this is the first time that I actually heard people's name mentioned as I'm walking to the car. And then they said, I said, who is this? This guy named Phil LaFonce and Doug Furness. Well, I know Doug from Continental. So it's, it's, he's all of a sudden got great since I saw him, which he hadn't. And, um, but there's this huge buildup for him. And then when they got there, they both uh, didn't last very long because they were really didn't get over. Same thing with Jacques Amore. You know, you heard so much about him. and But again, he's just a... Um, like a, a, another take, just a flamboyant Japanese Michael Jackson. And we've heard that last week it was all over the wrestling news that Raw hit an all-time low rating. I know you don't follow the internet, so you found that out from me. Do you think that has partly to do with the wrestlers that they're hiring now, or is it also the writers? Is it a combination of everything? You know, I haven't seen enough to blame the writers. The writers, and the, this is, I said this uh, months ago when I was seeing more of the show. The thing about the, the boys, we call them the guys there, the guys in the business today are maybe technically the sound as they've ever been in their wrestling ability and their mic skills. On, on a scale across the board, they're as equally as good as that's ever been in the business. So you have to point somewhat more towards the writers. And I'll give you an example of one of the horrible things I saw was um, that um, Kobe Kingston and those guys, what do they call themselves? Um, um, I know who you're talking about, but for some reason, I, the name isn't. Yeah, or, yeah well, they, they, they were having a little bit of feud with them. Um, the guys that were acting like they were from the black and white days. Oh yeah, the, the, I forget Vaudevillians. Vaudevillians, like yeah. and then there was I think one, two other guys. But they used a cardboard box in the ring and said, "This is a time machine." Now here it is. These guys are all working their tails off and and, and all yeah. really pretty good workers. But it was that time machine that what made it look so stupid. So the, I think it's right now more on the writers than it would be the talent. Uh, there's a rumor online, and I'm sure I already know the answer to this, but there's a rumor online that you had a pet squirrel at one point. Like, do you have any idea where that came from? That apparently in WCW, this is a rumor. That no, i tell you what I did have recently, a pet duck. Uh, okay. I had a duck. That I got a private pond in my backyard that I fish out of, and, and the duck, had, I guess, during duck season got wounded, and I fed it and brought it back to health, and it's recently flown away, and that's the only pet thing I've ever had other than a dog. I heard in an interview you... Uh, <laughs> You said that the people with the worst BO you encountered in uh, Germany. <laughs> Germany overseas. And uh, the worst was Austria. Oh, really? But everybody I've ever talked to, even I know a girl, she's not wrestling. She she lived, she lived in Germany, and she agreed, too. It's just Germany has got, the, I mean, you walk in the elevator, and your eyes just start burning. But I remember walking to the arena in Austria, and it just knocked me down. You know, the BO over there is just terrible. And what are your thoughts on Dave Meltzer? You know, I never met the guy, never talked to him. Um, I know from the beginning, like back in the day when I was Lord Humongous, this is why I don't know or talk, never talk to him. Um, Robert Fuller, who was the booker at the time, he says, Sid, do you ever read a kayfabe sheet? I said, no, I never have. He said, well, don't. There's a guy there, Dave Meltzer, he's really talking bad about you, saying you're the worst Lord Humongous he's ever been. He says, trust me, you're going to be something that one day in this business, I wouldn't have hired you. 
He says, but just, so don't be dirt sheets uh, and don't w worry about wrestling magazines and stuff like that for approval for yourself. You know, listen to your peers and like that. He goes, and you'll know, he said, if you ever read a d dirt sheet, you'd know who's calling in and you can almost tell by, you know, uh, of course, I knew Bruno was reading them every day and calling in all the time, so I knew he was one of the people, but uh, never have, never would. And what do you think about CM Punk's uh, two UFC fights? I'm sure you probably heard about that. No, I actually followed it, because you know, I, I follow UFC. Yeah. Um, I didn't understand it really quite. Uh, he was he would be, been a little bit better. You could understood it, why he would wanted to, to be a fighter. But he was so bad. I mean, you just, I don't know. You, you know you know yourself, David. I've met some guys in the locker room just in the last couple of months where since the USC is taking off now, some of the boys are saying they're doing that too on the side or they did that before USC or they're, they're, they got a fight coming up. Those guys aren't doing it. They're making that up yeah. for the most part. Um, but it's, um, it's, you know, USC is like, if you remember what I always – Related to, you know, when you were in school or at, at Reese, you know, like at lunch, if you were, you know, didn't have, you know, if they say the tenth grade or above, you didn't have PE. I mean, you didn't have recess; you had PE, or you know, your only time to relax would be after lunch. So that's when the fights would always happen. So you know, everybody ran to see the fight at lunch, but there's only two people fighting, yeah. and there's not a lot of people want to fight. Yeah, and so that's what I see is that you know these guys say they're going to do it, the boys say they're going to be in the, you know, the you know. To tip your hat to him, you know, he, he went out there and got beat up bad, <laughs> you know, you know and, and still tried it, you know. So, you know, um, and I think from I only know this, and this is just guessing, that that was sort of his way. To, now, I heard that he had a bad falling out with the wrestling business, that yeah, with WWF. WWF about something he was told he wasn't that good or something. I, I would have liked to, you know, done that. I would have liked to have some five hundred thousand to fight. I'm sure you would have. Oh, is that what he got paid? Yeah, I'm sure, I would have done it for two <laughs> two hundred fifty bucks. But no, I, I would have loved had the training of that. You know, of something like that. You know, being able to get in there and grind that out and stuff like that. That would have been fun. <laughs> But that, I'm sure that if that's the case, they get that money. That was just a, something, just to s sell some tickets. Yeah. And you were saying this at lunch, but more people are going to watch this by far. So, would you be open if if Bellator or some some company that had some money wanted to bring you in for a for a gimmick fight that was fair that you could train for? You would be open to something like that. You know, I would. This is the thing is, we talked about it in the last few years. I, Instead of all this heavy weightlifting, I'm doing more um, like cardio uh, agility drills, and and one of the one, I found one of the most taxing things that I, and I boxed as a kid is boxing is tough. It's the, you know yeah. standing there for just standing there this like this for three minutes is tough sometimes. So I've been doing that the last couple of years boxing, and um, you know once you're out there and you get in there and you spar a few gives in a couple of sparring sessions, and even today you know they'll try to match you up with somebody your age, you know the many have the many fights you've had or the same experience. But I can see that would be fun to try. How do you think Brock Lesnar is going to do? Uh, he's rumored to be fighting Daniel Cormier possibly in uh, January. You know, this is what's funny about that. You know, he uh, of course he killed Frank Mir the second time. Then that Overeem really had his way with him because we under you know we were told that he had some type of really yeah that, that surgery that, that, that deal. But then he um, man he really gave it to that Mark Hunt guy. Um, it seems like he has a little more trouble with the guys that are or better wrestlers like Frank Mir beating because of the ankle lock or the leg lock. Yeah. But, um, and then Mark Hunt had no wrestling skills and he dominated that because of his wrestling skills. I think he's going to have a tough time with Daniel Cormier. You know, I think, you know, Cormier is an Olympic guy, you know. Well, and apparently Cormier trains with Velasquez in wrestling and they're, they're sparring partners and apparently Cormier can beat Velasquez. And Velasquez has uh, got a first round TKO on Lesnar too. So oh, he does. Yeah, because Lesnar he actually had two two first round TKOs before the Mark Hunt, but that was supposedly when uh, he was dealing with the health issues. Also, oh, he he fought. Um, he fought twice before Mark. Because I, I what he fought. Uh, I forget who he lost the title to. 
Do you remember? He won it from uh, Shane Carwin. No, he won it. He yeah. won it from Randy Couture. Yeah. And they beat Shane beat Carwin. Shane Carwin and he beat Frank Muir. Yeah, I've got really lost. Two, uh, two losses after that, but I know Overeem and one. Velasquez. Maybe Velasquez was the one that took the title, I don't know. Could have been. But, uh, no, I, he's going to have a hard time with Daniel Cormier. Who, I, I used to really like Daniel Cormier as, you know, as a fan of the UFC. He's starting to rub me the, I'm starting to, he's starting to become a heel to me now a little bit. So I like to see Brock beat him, you know, because he's running his mouth a little bit. But um, did you see the thing that they had in the octagon after the last fight? No, I heard about it. Okay, but I, I'd like to see Brock win for sure for the for our, for the boys. But um, I think you'll have a tough time with him. And what do you think of Braun Strowman? He's he's I guess the most guy that's most similar to you. I guess they would have on the roster. You know, I've seen him a few times. I think he's he just I don't know. He just looks a lot of time out of place. Um, uh, I saw something that's been a long time ago. You know, where it was a handicap match and they let the guys kick him in the ass. You know, I just thought that was real stupid. I just don't see he's getting over. Um, I don't know if there's any reason for him to get over. There's really no one over there for him to work with, really. There's not another big guy. But uh, I don't think he's getting over. Did you see that the incident that happened? I'm sure you probably didn't, but I guess in the Royal Rumble, he did a stiff knee to Lesnar, so Lesnar gave him a few legitimate shots in the face. And I thought it was interesting that he just took the shots and this was replayed all over the place. But if he had actually fought back after Lesnar punched him in the face, he would have had nothing to lose. Right. Because no one would expect him to fight back. But it kind of disappointed me that he just took the two real shots from Lesnar. And then did. And, and like it showed that he wasn't a real fighter, fighter. that way. Oh, if that happened, that really probably wasn't good for him. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that was even on Joe Rogan's podcast. They even replayed it on that. Oh, really? It made news everywhere because that doesn't happen usually, right? So what he just, he actually stiff Lesnar? He, I, I guess it was an accident. He need Lesnar in the face and then Lesnar delivered a couple of legitimate punches to him that actually knocked him backwards. Backwards. But, yeah. Well, you hate that, but that's sort of the business, though. You know that if you stiff someone... And if you get that reputation, you know, you really, you're only, for Lesnar, his only uh, recourse there was to do that, you know, that's called a receipt. Yeah. You know. I just know if it had been me, but I would have at least tried to fight Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, the last questions I'll just ask you about the guys I'm interviewing in the next few days, because fans might be interested. Uh, Bill Dundee, what's your opinion of him? You know, Bill's, uh, he's. He, he come from the old days. The carnies were, you know, really, uh, um, if you could stay in the ring with a guy back in those days, you'd get 50 bucks. Well, Bill's one of those guys that would break your arm. You know, from my understanding, this is what, what Bruno told me. Bruno knows him real well. Real, um, with me, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> my experience with him, like he was uh, part of the booking team or always, you know, with someone in charge. Always did really well, good things with me. I remember mean, put me on this thing one time and putting Vaseline all over me to really make me shine, to present me. This is when they were doing the joint thing with Global. So they, you know, I mean, everything he ever did with me was positive. Um, and then, you know, seemed to have good head on the shoulders. Um, you know, just, just a pretty good old boy. And Kamala, I know you, you may have met him once on that big show I did the first time you wrestled for me, but yeah. um, what, are, what are your thoughts on Kamala? I think what I've heard, you know, what I've met him, super, super nice guy. Just, you know, a couple stories like I told you I heard were, like one of the last stories were, um, he gone, I think the town was a little rocky, got there and, and um, Corey Macklin didn't have the money to pay him and he, um, James, we don't have the money tonight, and he's such a super nice guy. He just, you know, shrugged it, off, shrugged it off, and said, "Okay, you know, super nice guy." From my understanding, I hate to hear about his health issues. Uh, that always saddens me when somebody's having a tough time. I, what I have heard though about how the people responded to him is great to hear that. Uh, I talked to uh, Kitty Casanova, who did his book. And uh, helped him out. You know that I think the fans really got together and 
um, did the fundraiser where they could write the book and then from understanding it, it's, it's done really well. So that right there, that, you know, um, that right there, when we hear about fans sometimes and with the love of the fans we have for and how much respect for them, that's all we do. I mean, those people do that. Like I just, I told you about the uh, little charities I have where at church we feed the homeless, we give them two cans of Viennas, a pack of crackers, a bottle of water. So I've got this little deal set up now where if people will call me, my phone numbers, you know, or get in touch with Psycho Sid Promotions, you know, if they send- uh, Psycho Sid Promotions is on Facebook? Yeah, on yeah. Facebook. So if you, you know, get in contact with the guy Eric there, he contacts me, he actually gives these people my phone number. I call them and I talk to them and uh, I'll send them an eight by 10, you know, autograph and they send, not to me, they send to my church uh, their choice of, uh, you know, a can, uh, case of Vienna sausages or a, a case of waters. We have a, uh, an orphanage in Haiti that we sponsor called St. Vincent's Orphanage and the downside to it is everyone that's handicapped. So um, in Haiti, the country there, if you're handicapped, you're automatically almost discarded. So they have 200 children there that if you see some of the pictures of the book I have, it's really hard to tell you hard part. You know, they don't have anything, hardly food or water. So like right now, um, a lady down in Louisiana, she just donated 200 tubes of toothpaste and 200 toothbrushes. Uh, a guy named Joe out, at, uh, out in Washington, who's, I just talked to him on the phone. He's just a fan. I'm sitting in Paris trunks that had to sit justice I'm signing he's sending me a uh, hundred dollars worth of children vitamins to send because in, in October is when uh, Dr. Susan Nelson one of the doctors that go over and help this they go four times a year so that's what we're concentrating right now is uh, vi children vitamins and stuff like that to get to to uh, that but then through all the rest of the time you know when it's just that and you know, I still same thing I send a autograph picture and or one of those little sport cards I will send that as well and they send and I never ask how much I see you send a can a case or whatever you want and, and so we have you know a few Viennas to give to the homeless and you give them the address you don't know the address off my heart do you yeah the, the address is um, 700 Poplar Avenue St. Mary's Cathedral and that's where we send everything to okay so anyone watching this they can reach out to Psycho Sid Promotions and talk with Eric yeah. who runs it and he'll contact you with me give you my phone number we'll talk and I'll give you the address to the, I think the church is 700 Poplar Avenue Memphis Tennessee I think it's 38 I don't want to get to that I'll lie yeah. about that but again it's easy to get in touch with me and that's a pretty good deal considering that a lot of wrestlers these days and guys like Eric Bischoff and Bruce Pritchard they are making fans buy shirts they'll buy a shirt for three dollars and then they'll they'll get a call from them so all you're saying is donate some food to a good cause it's not even for your own financial benefit no no and they'll get to talk to you and get an autographed picture so that's pretty yeah and, you, and again nothing comes to me it goes straight to the church and uh and uh so again then then you have my phone number you get to call me anytime you want <laughs> i don't know if you want to say that on yeah <laughs> well my phone's it's it's it, the phone number so uh, public everybody everybody's got my number people call me all the time but again that's why i feel i don't want it ever sent to me i want to sit to the church where it's going where it's no question i don't want to be a ted dibiase or person like that that's yeah. taking money from churches and what do you think about bruce pritchard now that now that i brought up his name i forgot to ask you about him you know bruce uh, i've not seen any of his uh, podcasts heard they're pretty cool and popular and stuff like that uh, bruce was a you know, I don't know how to explain him. He was, uh, seemed to be a really nice guy. He, you know, uh, has a f funny voice and everything, but, and this is no knock to him or anyone like JR or anything like that. All those guys were pretty nice to me, but they, uh, their, their job in the business was just a stooge. You know, they were stooges for Vince. And yeah, man, yes, Vince, that sounds cool. You know, where Vince said, they said, you know. Other than that, that's pretty much their job title. but. Other than saying that as well, they were really good to me, nice to me. Um, you know, so I, you know, JR is one of the nicest people to me. I've met him in w, WCW, WWF again. Bruce Pritchard was always super nice to me. And I knew his brother, uh, Tom. Tom, down in Continental when I started down there. So again, just nothing bad to say other than they were, you know, really nice to me. 
And Jerry Jarrett, we're interviewing him in a couple days. Any uh, stories about him? You know, Jerry Jarrett's a really uh, another guy who's super nice to me, gave me always great compliments. You know, uh, you always go through things, meet people in life, and pick up something here or there that you might learn. One thing he taught me, and I still pe tell people this today, I told uh, some guys on a show at World Class uh, Revolution this past weekend, I was on, I said, and I learned this at Lord Humongous, he said, Sid, when you think you're over-exaggerating, you're probably not exaggerating enough, and I think that's always good advice to give some you know, p people just getting in the business, so that was one bit of advice he gave me, it was good. So you never gave me bad advice. And Tracy Smothers, I know he likes you a lot. Uh, any thoughts on him? He is just a super nice guy, man. Again, started off, you know, me and him started in Memphis together, right where you know we are right now in Memphis. And just another good guy, man. Just honest, hard worker, um, never cared about, you know, never seen him jealous of anybody, just, you know, worried about what he was doing for himself and just another super nice guy and someone, not, you know, never, not a moment, not one crossword with each other the whole time we've known each other, just a super, super nice guy. And I already asked you about this off camera, but I'm sure Carl will like it if I bring up his name on this. and. What do you think of the success that uh, that Carl Willett has had lately? He's had kind of a resurgence at 50 or 51. Well, you know, when you brought me up for that show in Ottawa, you know, he was working with that a legitimate strong man. Yeah. You know, think about this, and you know Carl, too. He, he is a hard worker, and I'm really proud of what he's doing. Now, I haven't seen it. Uh, again, Eric, Psycho Super Motions, Promotions keeps a close eye on tells me that he's doing real good. I'm very proud of what he's doing. I think um, I think it was I think they missed the boat on Carl. You know, he's not Hulk Hogan or um, um, Sid Vicious or anything like that. But he was a hell of a worker, had a lot to offer the business. And I still think he can do something. No, his his promo as Sid Vicious or Hulk Hogan would be pretty funny to hear that. Yeah, well, that man. accent. Yeah, but I like Carl to death. He was uh, always a you know big good friend of mine and big supporter for me and always helped me out. Like I said, I told you a story. Got that helped me show me how to do that turnbuckle and got that shit off my shoulder. You know, so a lot of guys wouldn't bother to have done that for you. Did you get along with Bret Hart? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, we got along good. It weren't weren't uh, like you know best friends or anything, but we got along good in the dressing room always and stuff like that. How would you say uh, your relationship is with Vince McMahon now? If if you guys were to see each other, would you guys still be friends? Or? Well, we never were friends, but you know I'm sure we'd be just as cordial you know as we would be back then. You know um, the. You know, in the business, like even with Lawler, I said me and Lawler were much better friends than me and Vince. You know, me and Lawler would ride together sometimes and talk, and Lawler, I think, is a little bit nicer person. Now, Vince is a businessman, and that's what we were, this business together. Um, and we clashed sometimes, but um, other than that, he was, you know, he was as equally as good to me as he was equally as bad to me. You know, so he, he did some really good things for me, and. He uh, gave me a job and gave me a job, helped support my family. So you always got to be grateful for that. Uh, I got you know royalty check today from the WWF, still get, getting that. So you know you can't be very mad at someone who's paying you. You know, and he always paid. He wasn't the greatest payoff guy, but you know, um, I always felt comfortable saying anything to him that I wanted to. He he wouldn't he, he wouldn't say, hey, I'm Vince, Vince McMahon, don't talk to me, but other than like, yes, sir, no, sir. You know, he was, he was pretty equal like that. I'm sure they are eventually going to put you in the Hall of Fame. I know you don't care too much about that. Right. But it just goes without saying they're going to have to put you in there. But do you still have interest in, in having a role with them as a manager or some you know, type of role? I would. You know, honestly, I, I, I think we talked a little bit about it. I would like to somehow. I, the reason, and I told you and I said it on um, Sean Moody's podcast why I'm a little reluctant to want to do the Hall of Fame is that I really want to be able to say that I earned it and with my injury I think I came a little short of really saying hey I really solidified myself as one of the top 10 or 15 money drawers in the business that to me is working I, I, I can't do a backdrop but I can draw money yeah. and so that's what I like to have been, been able to done I still think today I could be a good manager uh, I, I know 
I don't know why I love to be in wheelchair. I, I love wheelchairs. I, I think that's great heat. But I would like to do something like that. Um, and that, again, not wanting to be in the Hall of Fame is just really mostly feeling like I don't deserve it. I didn't really solidify myself. My career was cut a little short. And then when I had a chance to come back, uh, you know, Johnny Ace uh, refused, did not want to talk to my attorney. I didn't want to talk because I'm pretty easily to argue, start an argument. And I did, and I actually started an argument with Johnny when he told me he didn't want to talk to my lawyer. I said, this is where I didn't want to get to. I didn't want to start arguing with you. Uh, I wanted this to be easier. Uh, so I feel like I was shorted there. I had still something left in the tank, and uh, they, they didn't, I didn't get a chance to do that. And uh, you just became a grandfather. Is everything going well with your family? These Everything's days? doing good. Now the baby was born a little early, um, about seven weeks early, which is, that's early. Uh, but he's um, you know he's still he's got a little breathing tube and a, a, a feeder, but he's. Um, he was four point four pounds born, but he's like twenty one inches. So, but he's a beautiful little baby boy, and my son's very happy. And my daughter in is very happy, and of course, my wife is really happy. So that just it really makes everything good. And you have no legitimate social media, so other than psychosid promotions, um, it's someone faking it. If anyone's online. Um, just to state that for the record, but that's not me. I do talk. Yeah. To, I do talk to the guys, thing to Eric Wigan or Wigan or something like that, and we do have some of the same thoughts on the business. But um, he does everything. Sometimes I even ask him, Eric, don't write this. He goes, Well, I have my own artistic view. I said, Okay, do your artistic view. I don't care what you say, but that isn't me. But I do talk to Eric a lot. We do. Uh, I think we made fun of the time machine together that time. I, I did say some of those things, but other than that, that's I don't um, I don't get out there on this on that type of deal. I don't feel comfortable on the, that social media platform. And to finish this off, could you do a little promo into the camera for us? When the sun comes up, and the first thing you see is me, and the dust clears. You'll look up to me and you'll say, Sid, you are the master and you are the ruler of the world. I'd like to, uh, real quick, thanks, uh, thank Devin with Handle TV for giving me a second here to talk about the charities that I'm involved with. One of them is um, we it's called Pot Tops at uh, St. Mary's Cathedral here in Memphis, Tennessee, where we feed uh, the homeless on Saturday mornings, Wednesday mornings, and also on Sunday mornings. And what we try to do is on Saturdays we give a couple cans of Viennas, a pack of crackers, a bottle of water, uh, a moon pie, or an oatmeal cake or something like that. And doing that, the guy. Drew Woodruff, who has headed this thing for the last 10 years, has given away up to 150,000 cans of Viennas. We also have an orphanage we uh, take care of, we sponsor in Haiti, it's, and you can see the uh, website, it's under West Tennessee Haiti Partnership.org. And we got uh, our next trip going over is in October. And some of the things we look for are like children vitamins, because that's a, that's a lot of reason why the children in, in Haiti are handicapped because they don't get vitamins during the parents don't get vitamins during uh, um, during the care the carriage of having a child so in Haiti there again I was telling Devin if you're handicapped you're almost automatically discarded and the orphanage that we do sponsor every child there is handicapped unfortunately but um, we're looking for anything like that any kind of help we can get so what I like to do and what I do personally if you contact Sid Promotions and talk to Eric Eric could contact, get you in contact with me and what we do is I'll send you Whatever I have would be uh, eight by 10 or a trading card or we work out some things on tights and stuff. But what I'll ask for is this, I'll send you autographed picture or something we agree on and you send to the church, St. Mary's Cathedral, what you want to send, either a case of water, a case of, of Vienna sausages, a box of crackers. I don't ask for you to do this for this picture. You give what you want and I'll give you a picture of whatever I, whatever I have. I have recently traded or given a guy a pair of tights for, um, uh, for some vitamins 
vitamins that go to the children in Haiti. So vitamins or anything like that. But the first contact is because anything's expired, when they go to take it over, they'll automatically discard everything that's with it. So it's a real, when we're sending things to the children in Haiti, it's a, a, we gotta really watch the expiration date. But if you wanna, real quick, you know, eight by 10, get in touch with Cycle City Promotions, in touch with Eric, Eric can get you in contact with me, give you my phone number, I'll get your address, I'll send you a picture, and I'll give you the address to the church that you can send your donation. So they'll actually get to talk to you on the phone. Yeah, well, well, we'll talk to each other. And you talk to some of the guys, and we always we post who has sent things. We we post your names and and, and thank you for the, for what you've done. And these people, uh, a guy named Joey out in Washington, he just called me the other day, and he's uh, sending some vitamins for the kids because we have a trip going over in October, and he's sending vitamins, and I'm sending him a pair of trunks that I wore when I was Sid Justice, and that's what he was wanting. So if I have something that you want. That's what we can do too, but I've got many, many, many eight by tens that I can send you for something as well too. So for autograph or something, at least an eight by 10, we can get you something. So get in touch with Cycle Sip Promotions. And again, I wanna thank uh, Devin with uh, Hannibal Productions here for helping me out on this.